Okay, let's talk about the tile set class. What is a tile set anyways? So here's an example of a tile set from an old NES game. A tile set is a rectangle, that's an image, and it's a rectangle of rectangles. Now notice if I zoom in the upper left hand corner I can see that it has these gray borders in it and that means each tile is separated. I don't want the gray borders when I print or when I copy the images of the tiles to my screen. So a tile set is a rectangle of rectangles and it has rows and it has columns and I have to be able to grab the tiles out of the tile set and draw them individually to the screen and in some way I have to handle with the border. So let's look at a more official definition here. A tile set is a rectangle of rectangles. It has a number of columns and a number of rows. Each sub-rectangle is separated by a border of some thickness. Okay, well if I consider the pixel in the upper left hand corner dealing with screen coordinates, that's at 0 comma 0. And I don't want to start drawing my tile to the screen from that location. I actually want to start drawing my tile from the location 1 comma 1, right here. Remember, screen coordinates work this way. The x positive direction goes to the right, and the y positive direction goes downward instead of upward from traditional algebra. Also, a tile within a tile set has a given width. In this case, it's 16 pixels. That's not including the gray border. It also has a height of 16 pixels, not including the gray border. And so I know what the widths are now for my tiles in my tile set. So what should a tile set have? A tile set should possess what kind of variables and what kind of behaviors. So let's look at this. Let's look at a list of things a tile set should have. A tile set should have rows. It should have columns. It should have tile width. It should have the total number of tiles. When we deal with the borders, the gray borders, we need to know how thick they are. And notice I have horizontal lines as well as vertical lines. So we're going to call that an X offset and a Y offset to help us deal with the borders so that we don't accidentally copy those borders into our game. Also, a tile set should have image data. It should have a path to a file because we have to be loading this image from somewhere. It should have the ability to draw itself to the screen so that we can at least see if we've loaded the tile set correctly. And it should have the ability to load itself to the screen. Or in other words, it should have the ability to load itself. What I mean by that is uh, not the ability to draw itself necessarily, but the ability to load itself. So, in other words, if I have one tile set and I want to exchange it for another tile set, I should have the ability to do that, to reload another tile set into and replace the old one. Okay? So at least that's a good starting point. That may not be everything a tile set should have, but that's a really good place to start. So, okay, let's talk about our import statements. What kind of things are we going to need? So let's work with our imports first. We know we're going to need to deal with images, so there are right off the bat two classes that we need to deal with. Buffered image and the image IO class, which will help us read buffered images from a file. So let's import java.awt.image.bufferedImage and let's also import javax.imageio dot image io. So we're going to need those two classes. We're also going to need a file class, so import java.io.file. And finally we're going to need the graphics class, java.awt dot, whoops, need the import state, import java.awt dot graphics. Okay, so these are the basic import statements that we're going to need in order to get our tile set to work. So we've got the imports we need. I've created here an empty tile set class. And going back in the video to when we talked about what should a tile set have, 
this is a great time now to start implementing what a tile set should have. So okay, a tile set should have a number of rows and a number of columns. So I'm going to say private uh, integer rows, private integer columns. What else should a tile set have? Well, we talked about having a, an X offset and a Y offset dealing with the border. So private integer X offset, private integer Y offset. What else should a tile set have? It should have image data. And so private, uh, into, uh, not image, but this is going to be a buffered image. And I'm going to call this just plain old image. And so that will hold the actual image data of the tile set itself. Okay. Well, I'm also going to put in some default values. <clears throat> so I'm going to allow my tile set to have any number of rows or any number of columns, but I'm also going to have my tile set to have a default number. If I, if I don't make a decision, it will decide for me. And so what I've decided to do is to make several constants. And so one of the constants that I'm going to make here is um, final static int default, I guess I spelled default correctly, default number of rows. And so I'm going to start off with 10 rows. Final static int default number of calls. I start off with 10. And so that's a good place to start off with my default rows and columns. I'm also going to have a default tile side length, which I haven't mentioned yet. So actually, we need to put that in there as a variable. So private integer tile side length. So I am assuming right now that my tiles are squares because the tile side length will represent both the width and the height. All right, back to my constants here. I'm going to declare uh, something called a default tile side length, final static int default tile side length. And I'm going to say it's 16 pixels. When we start working and creating our own tiles, they'll be 32 by 32. So we can change that number later. Uh, let's see. I should also have a default number of tiles. So final static int default number of tiles. And that's going to be 100, which is 10 by 10. I spell final correctly. I should also have uh, two more variables that are that are uh, constants: a default x offset and a default y offset. So final static int default x offset equals one. That means that the gray border is a width of one. And final static int default y offset. That means that the gray border is a width of 1 in the y direction. This is a width of 1 in the x direction. And that's pretty much the basics right there. These are final because they're constants, and it's always a good idea to capitalize your constants. It's a good uh, a methodology. They're static because they'll belong to the class itself. So these will only belong to the tile set class, and they won't belong to any object that we create from the tile set class. These variables right here are the instance variables, rows, calls, tile, side length, x offset, y offset, and image. So when I actually create a tile set object, these instance variables will be inherited from that object. All right, so that is a good start for my instance variables declarations. Let's talk next about constructors. Before I get into constructors, there were two instance variables I forgot. The first one is a private string called URL. That will be the path to the file in the file system where my image is stored that I can load into my tile set. So I need a string called URL. And I also need a private integer called number of tiles. So when I know exactly how many rows and how many columns I have, 
If I have something other than the default, I'll just take rows times columns, and that'll give me the number of tiles. Okay, let's talk constructors, and so we begin with the default constructor. Now, normally, the default constructor doesn't really need anything inside of it, uh, but there are some default values that need to be set here. And so I'm not going to do anything with the URL. That's just going to be set equal to null. But I do need to set initially my number of tiles. I need to set rows to the default number, columns to the default number, tile side length to the default number, and my offsets to the default number. So let's just go ahead and do that. Here I'm going to say this dot number of tiles equals and then default number of tiles. Then this dot rows equals default number of rows. This dot columns equals default and then it's so nice that it get filled, gets filled in for me here so I don't have to keep typing that again and again. Uh, let's see, this dot tile side length equals default tile side length. Let's see, what else here? Uh, this dot x offset equals default x offset. And this dot y offset equals default y offset right here. And so this is what the default constructor will do. Notice I haven't said anything about URL. It will just set the URL equal to null. I haven't said anything about the image. It'll make the image null, okay? But because I do have these constants here, these default constants, I have a little bit of work to do in the default constructor to make sure or to ensure that those instance variables do get set to their default values. If I didn't do that, then when the object is created, those instance variables would just be set equal to zero, and that's not what I want. I want them to become their default values. All right, let's talk about the next constructor, which is not a default constructor. It's a constructor that we're going to make, we're going to customize, so that we can customize a tile set the way that we want it. So here we are in the second constructor, and in this constructor, this is a customized constructor. In other words, now we can customize the tile set exactly the way that we want it at the moment of its creation. So it takes in some parameters. It takes in a URL, a rows, calls, tile side length, X offset, Y offset. Now, those are the exact same names as the instance variables here, but they're shadowed. Uh, in other words, these are not exactly the variables that belong to the class, and that's why I have to use this. So when I say this.url, I'm referring to this guy right here. When I say equals URL, I'm referring to the parameter that's being passed in. So even though they share the same name, this keyword refers back to the instance variable that belongs in the class, or the object, once it's created. And this one belongs to the parameter being passed in. So I can pass in any string of text and it's set equal to the instance variable URL. So this.url equals URL, this.rows equals rows, this.calls equals calls, this.tileside length equals tileside length, this.x offset equals x offset, this.y offset equals y offset, and the number of tiles is nothing more than a function of rows and calls. You multiply the two together and then you've got the number of tiles. Now, a try catch block is absolutely necessary because now I have to open the file from the path, the URL path, and get the image data from there. And this is why I need the image IO class, because it has a cool little method called read, which can read an image from a path and store it into a buffered image. So I say try, I say buffered image image is equal to image IO dot read, the new file URL, so that opens up the URL, grabs the image from that path, reads it, stores it into the buffered image. And then I have a setter called set image, which I'm going to show you later, and it sets that image into the instance variable image right here. And if anything goes wrong, I run a stack trace, and what a stack trace is, is it's a list of where things went wrong in the correct order so I can trace back and figure out where the error occurred. 
And so this is our nice customized constructor right here. So we can actually create a tile set exactly the way we want to at the moment of creation. So now it's time to talk about setters and getters. It's time to talk setters and getters. A setter is a method that is a mutator. And what it does is it will alter the state of that variable. So for example, I have a string, an instance variable called URL. And the setter for URL is right here. Public void set URL. So when I pass in a new URL, it creates the URL or resets the old URL to be the new URL that I pass in. So this is a setter. A getter is an accessor. So it needs the return value. And in this case, here on line 57, URL is a string. So I need to say public string get URL and then use the return keyword return URL. So this is the setter here and the getter for the URL instance variable. Setters typically are void because they won't return anything. Getters can't be void. They have to have the return type. So if you create a getter for number of tiles or rows or columns or any of these ints, then the return type would have to be int instead of string because that's their type. So this is pretty much how setters and getters work. So what you need to do is you need to create a setter and a getter for URL, number of tiles, rows, calls, tile side length, X offset, Y offset, and even for buffered image, the ability to set and get a buffered image. So um, the getter return type would not be void for this one. It would be buffered image, return this dot image would be the getter. The setter would be void, but it would take inside the parens a buffered image just called image. <clears throat> so you would say this dot image equals image. So that's what you have to do next. You have to create setters and getters for these instance variables right here. All right. Taking a look back at my default constructor, what this does is this sets the instance variables to their default values. <clears throat> the URL is set to null, the image is set to null. I really want a method that can load a tile set if I begin with an empty tile set because what I'll have to do now is I'll have to use, if I create an empty tile set using a default constructor, I'll have to use all my setters <clears throat> in order to get the thing running and I'd rather have one method that does all that now, if I use this constructor, my customized constructor, then I won't need to load anything. But if I use my default constructor, or perhaps even if I want to change the original values from one that I loaded in into a tile set, then I probably should create a method called load tile set. And that's what we're going to do next. We're going to create a method, and it's going to be called load tile set. And so this is how it works. <laughs> Uh, it is public void. It doesn't return anything. It's a it's a mutator is what it does. And it goes off my screen a little bit, but let me go ahead and read you what it takes. It takes a string called a URL, takes two integers, rows and calls, takes an integer tiled side length. You can't see it on the screen right now, but it takes an offset, X offset, and a Y offset. And then I begin a try catch block because I need to read in the image data from the URL. So buffered image equals image IO dot read new file URL I set the image using my setter I set the URL I set the rows I set the columns I set the tile side length I set the offsets all using the setter methods that we've just created and then obviously catch the exception in case something goes wrong and that is my method load tile set so now if I want to just load a new tile set and replace the old information on the previous tile set or if I have an empty tile set, I can call this method and it will load in a whole new tile set into my original tile set and replace all the old information. So go ahead and code up one of these. All right. Well, if I'm going to have a tile set that's useful, I have to be able to grab tiles out of the tile set. 
If I don't have that functionality, the whole thing is pointless. Now, what I want to be able to do is to grab the tiles, counting by tiles and not by pixels. So, for example, I'm going to consider the stairs here to be at the coordinate 0, 0. However, the pixel begins, the first pixel that begins is at 1, 1. I'm going to consider the boulder to be at 1, 0. But if you consider it at the pixel level, the pixel where the boulder begins is actually at 18, 1. And so I want to count by tiles and not by pixels. So I'm going to have to have some kind of a conversion process. And that's where I'm going to call in or rely upon an arithmetic sequence. So let's look at the first four tiles in the first row. Now I'm only showing you two. And so the numbers I'm going to give you would be for the first four tiles in the first row. Okay. So the pixel or the x-coordinate for the stairs is at 1. The x-coordinate for the boulder is at 18, 18. The next one in the same row, which I'm not showing you, would be at 25, and the next one would be at 42. Now, this is an arithmetic sequence, because if you subtract any term minus the one before it, you always get a common difference of 17, and the first term is 1. And that is going to help me save the day, because now I have a way to convert from counting by tiles into pixels. Me as a human being, I want to count by tiles. I'm going to let the computer worry about all the pixels. I just need a formula that converts from counting by tiles into counting by pixels. And that's exactly what this is going to do. A sub n is the sequence, and 17n plus 1 is the conversion. So, for example, the x-coordinate of the staircase is at 1, 1 but I'm going to consider, consider the ordered pair 0, 0, where the x value is 0. Well, all I have to do is put in 0 for n, 17 times 0 plus 1 is 1, and it immediately converts to the pixel that I want. If I want the x value of the boulder, which is 18, I say 17 times 1 plus 1, which is 18, and so on and so on and so forth. So now I, the human being, can count by tiles, and this little formula, 17n plus 1, is going to convert it into the pixels that I need. Now, where is the 17 coming from? Well, I'm pretty sure you would agree with me that 17 is the same thing as 16 plus 1. But 16 isn't just any number. It turns out that 16 is the tile width. And the plus 1 in both cases of the formula is the x offset. In other words, it's the width of the, the gray border. And now what that means is, is I can create an algebraic expression that represents any possible tile set with any possible tile width and any possible offset. I can actually get an algebraic expression out of it, and here it is. The x component in pixels will be the tile width plus the x offset, in parentheses, times n, where n is the, count, is the count of the tile for the x value that you're looking for, plus the x offset, so that'll, that'll give you the x value for the pixel, and the y value is the tile width plus the y offset, times n, plus the y offset. Now this, of course, assumes that your tiles are perfect squares, which we're going to assume. But if your tiles are more are different kinds of rectangles, if you have a height that's different than your width, you just replace tile width in the ANY formula with tile height. And then you can generalize the formula further. And so the beautiful thing about this formula is it allows me to count now by tiles. And it will do the pixel conversion for me. So 0, 0 will convert into zero into 1, 1, which is the beginning pixel for the staircase. 1, 0 will convert into 18, 1. 0, 1, the staircase, the blue staircase, will convert into 1, 18. And the brown tree, which is I'm going to count at 1, 1, will convert into 18, 18. So what's the magic formula that's going to grab these tiles for me? Well, it's a built-in formula in the buffered image class called get subimage. 
And so what you're looking at here is the Java documentation for the get sub image method. So let's look at it together. First of all, it's public. It returns a buffered image, which will be our tile. The method is called get sub image, and it takes four different variables, four local variables, an x, a y, a width, and a height. Now the x and the y that it's expecting are pixel coordinates. And that's why I need this formula here in order to make this work. This is going to help me convert from counting by tiles into pixels. So the x and the y values are pixel coordinates and the width and the height are the width and the height in pixels for this region. And so it's going to return a buffered image. If something went wrong, look at the bottom part which says throws. If something went wrong with reading the image, then it throws something called a raster format exception. If the specified area is not contained within this buffered image, that's the kind of error or exception that it's going to throw. So now I know the magic formula that's going to make this work, that's going to convert from counting by tiles into pixels, and I now have the magic method that's going to make this happen. It's called get sub image. So now let's go ahead and look at how I would implement this. So here I am inside of the tileset class, and this is a method I've created called get tile. It's public, it returns a buffered image. The name of the method is get tile. It reads in an X and a Y and a side length because I'm assuming that my tiles are squares. Now here's what you need to know. The X and the Y that are coming into the method are tile coordinates, not pixel coordinates. So what I have to do is I have to use the conversion formula that I just gave you in order to convert my tile coordinates into pixel coordinates. Then it's just a matter of saying buffered image, declaring a buffered image called subimage. I use my get image method that we created when we did our setters and getters. So get image returns the actual image data of the tile set. And then since that returns a buffered image, I can then chain together the get subimage method. So this is called method chaining using one method and then the dot operator to successfully use a next method. Now I pass in my x and the y, but because of the conversions, these are now pixel coordinates, the side length and the side length representing the width and the height, and then I use the return keyword and return sub image. So there it is. There's my get tile method, which actually allows me to grab any tile I want out of my tile set and I don't have to count by pixels. I can count by tiles. And that's the beauty of it. Now, I'm going to show you an even better version of get tile. So what's going to happen is I'm going to create another method called get tile, but I'm going to give it different parameters, and that's called overloading. When you give a method another implementation with the same name, but you change the parameters, or in other words, inside the parentheses here are called the signature of the method. The signature of the method. If you change the signature and give another implementation, that's called overloading, which means you give the method more functionality. And I'm going to show you an even better way to grab a tile out of the tile set. So, okay. What is this better way of getting a tile out of the tile set? Because right now I'm using ordered pairs, which means I have two pieces of information for every single tile. I have an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. The stairs are at 0, 0. The boulders at 1, 0. The green tree, if you can locate that, that would actually be located at 7, 1. So I'm actually using two numbers to record a single tile. But what if instead of two numbers, I used one number to represent every tile? So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin naming my tiles at the staircase with zero, and then I'm going to count to the right and just index all my tiles. So I assign numbers. So 
going all the way across each row and giving an index or a number for every single tile. Now I kind of ran out of time. I need to kind of get this lesson online quickly, which is why I haven't numbered everything, but you get the point. I would keep on going until every tile in my tile set is indexed. The question is now, instead of using an ordered pair, can I take the index, convert that into a tile coordinate, an XY ordered pair, and then convert the tile coordinate into pixel coordinates like I just did in the previous part? And the answer is yes. And I'm going to show you how to do that now. So here we go. Last part of our video. And then we're finished with the tile set for now. Here's another implementation of the get tile method. So this is now overloaded. But notice this time I'm passing in an index, which is the number associated with each tile, and just the side length. And the conversion is simple. All I have to do is take the index and perform the modulo operator with the number of columns. And that's it. Now think about that. For example, if I take an index of 25, which by the way, that's where the tree was, okay, 25, and there was a total number of columns, let me make sure I say this right, there was 18 columns altogether in the tile set. So what's the remainder if I divide 18 into 25? It's 7. Now this here for the y value, that's integer division. So how many times does 18 go into 25? Remember, there are no decimals with integer division. The answer here would be 1. So this would be the ordered pair 7 comma 1. Well, that's the tile coordinate for the tree, 7 comma 1. And so these, this conversion right here will convert from an index into tile coordinates. And then all I have to do is do exactly what I did previously, convert from tile coordinates into pixel coordinates. And now I just get my subimage again and return it. So the beautiful thing about this method is, is that I don't have to use two numbers. I don't have to use an ordered pair to represent a single tile. I can use a single number to represent a tile and get any tile I want out of the tile set. For right now, that is the complete tile set class. God bless you, wherever you are today.